Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jamison Bachman? He was featured in the 2022 Netflix series, Worst Roommate Ever, which was based on a 2018 article written in New York Magazine. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background in this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Jamison Bachman was born in 1957. He grew up in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, which is just north of Philadelphia. His father owned a construction company, and his mother stayed at home. He had a brother named Harry, who was four years older. Jamison was relatively popular in school. He was intelligent. He read a number of books, and he was incredibly competitive, although he looked for unfair advantages in any type of contest or game. His parents had very high hopes for him, and they were encouraging. His maternal grandfather was a well-known attorney in Philadelphia who occasionally would take Jamison to murder trials. Jamison would often brag about his grandfather's accomplishments. Jamison developed a tendency to make up grandiose tales about his accomplishments. He had some problems with his temper, and would get very angry over perceived injustices. After graduating from high school, he went to college in New Orleans, Louisiana. He started in the fall of 1975. On January 29, 1976, Jamison was eating dinner at a fraternity house with a 20-year-old friend of his from Elkins Park named Ken Gutseat. Jamison was not a member of the fraternity. He was just visiting. Ken had been in a long-standing dispute with a 25-year-old assistant librarian and part-time student named Randall Vidrain. Apparently, Ken had entered the library in November eating a cheese sandwich. He refused to leave after being confronted by Randall. This happened again, and Randall called the campus police to remove him. On this evening, when Jamison just happened to be with his friend Ken, Randall walked by the fraternity house, and Ken tried to provoke a fight. Randall walked home, retrieved a knife, and returned to the fraternity house. Ken grabbed Randall, and Randall stabbed him in the side of the neck. Ken died after his carotid artery was severed. A grand jury would later refuse to indict Randall for murder. There was never any update on what happened to the cheese sandwich. Jamison left college and returned home in the summer of 1976. He was treated by a mental health clinician who said Jamison was excessively dependent on the world and wondered if he had a personality disorder. Eventually, the clinician determined that Jamison was depressed. It's not exactly clear what happened over the next several years. Jamison would later claim that he served in the Israeli army and lived in the Netherlands. When Jamison was 45, he earned a law degree after attending Georgetown and the University of Miami. His professors remembered him as having extraordinary talent and being remarkable. In 2003, he used his remarkable talents to fail the bar exam. He never attempted to take it again. Jamison would go on to become an aggressive serial squatter and terrorize roommates in various locations on the East Coast. His typical pattern was to target someone renting an apartment who needed a roommate. Jamison would appear to be reputable and upstanding, so they let him in. Then he would stop paying the rent. When they filed in court to have him evicted, he would defend himself and countersue based on frivolous complaints. It's not clear when he first started doing this, we know that in 2005, he encountered a woman named Arlene Herbadian. She lived in Queens, New York, and became romantically involved with Jamison. She allowed him to live in her apartment in June of 2006, after he was evicted from a house owned by his employer. He was fired from the job, so they kicked him out. Jamison paid a little bit of rent to Arlene initially, but then he stopped. He refused to split other expenses. He rearranged the furniture. There were a number of confrontations between Jamison and Arlene. He would glare at her, try to intimidate her, and generally be disagreeable. She tried to kick him out of the apartment, but he refused to leave. The two went back and forth in court for years. 
in October of 2010, they were involved in a physical altercation. They each filed an order of protection against each other. Arlene was arrested after Jamison said she attacked him with a knife. She denied doing this. She was not allowed to return to her apartment. The landlord tried to kick Jamison out, which resulted in more time in court. Jamison would run the water in the apartment all the time to drive up the bill. He would make noise to disturb the tenant in the unit below him and was generally argumentative and hostile. Jamison was finally evicted in February of 2012. After this, he rented a condominium from a woman named Sonia Acevedo. This was also in Queens. Everything was fine for the first few months of them living together, but then Jamison stopped paying the rent. In September of 2012, Sonia filed for eviction. Jamison became aggressive. After Hurricane Sandy hit the area hard, Jamison left on his own. Sonia was financially devastated and eventually lost the condominium when she couldn't afford to pay the mortgage. After this, Jamison rented space from a woman in Philadelphia named Melissa Frost. He used the same strategy he had used before, being nice at first, then becoming aggressive. She offered to return some of his rent and find him a new place to live. He laughed at her and said, quote, You've got your whole life in front of you. You're pretty and you're talented and you've got this house. Well, you don't have this house anymore. This house is my house, unquote. In 2015, Jamison was in South Carolina, where he engaged in a legal dispute with a real estate agent. In 2016, he rented space from a man in Washington, D.C. They argued over a bath mat that Jamison would throw in the corner of the bathroom each time he used it. When looking at all the complaints against Jamison, this one doesn't seem to be that serious comparatively, although bath mat placement is a big deal for some people. In January of 2017, Jamison moved to a home in Philadelphia. He attacked the owner with a coffee table leg. In March of 2017, he answered a Craigslist ad placed by a woman named Alex Miller. She rented an apartment in Philadelphia and needed a roommate. Jamison used the name Jed Creek. He said that he had a legal background, but was not currently a lawyer. Alex met him and she thought he would be a good roommate. He indicated he wanted to move in right away. As was his routine, he did not pay his rent, he moved around the furniture, and he became aggressive when confronted. On May 1, 2017, Alex threw a party with a number of friends, designed to annoy him and motivate him to move out. The next morning, Jamison attacked Alex. He choked her, slammed her leg in a door, and cut her leg with a knife. He was arrested. His brother Harry bailed him out of jail. Jamison was arrested again after threatening Alex in the police parking lot when she was returning his property to him. Once again, his brother, Harry, bailed him out. On November 4, 2017, Harry Bachman was found dead in the basement of his residence. It was clear there had been a struggle. There was blood all over the dining room and a trail of blood leading to the basement. A notification on Harry's phone indicated his credit card was used at a nearby hotel. The police went there and found Jamison. When the SWAT team was arresting him at about 10.30 p.m., he attacked them with an axe. Jamison was charged with first-degree murder. On December 8, 2017, when he was in jail, he brought an end to his own life by hanging. He was 60 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Here are a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. One potential dynamic that drove Jamison to be so resentful, petty, and vindictive may have been his relationship with his parents. He was extremely envious of his older brother, Harry. His parents expected a lot of him, but Harry was the one who was actually successful. So they started to pay more positive attention to Harry and may have neglected Jamison. I think it's telling that Jamison was threatening and physically violent on a number of occasions, but ultimately, when his behavior escalated to murder, his brother was the victim. I think this was the key relationship he could not resolve. Jamison could not stand to be confronted with his own perceived failure. Some people believe that when Jamison witnessed that murder in 1976, this led to his behavior. This is possible, like maybe he became worried about being killed and thought people were out to get him. The problem is that his behavior put him in more danger 
He was aggressive and violent, not passive and fearful. Item number two, Jamison had an interesting personality profile. He appeared to have all three of the dark triad traits, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. From psychopathy, we see that he was cold, dominant, deceptive, irresponsible, had superficial charm, and did not have remorse. From narcissism, he had a sense of entitlement, he was self-centered, arrogant, condescending, distrusting, resentful, vindictive, envious, and grandiose. From Machiavellianism, he was cynical, calculating, and manipulative. Item number three is the pattern of Jamison's scam. Many of his roommates reported that for the first few months, they found him to be pleasant. It was when they asked him for money that the problem started. He would point out something trivial, like dishes being left in the sink, and say that voided his lease. He would use a lot of legal terms to try to intimidate them, like quiet enjoyment. Jamison was trying to provoke a conflict. He wanted other people to come after him so he could counterattack with a sense of righteous indignation. In a way, Jamison was punishing people for trusting him. He would often work his way into the apartment by supplying a sad story. For example, he had nowhere else to go, he was displaced by Hurricane Sandy, or he needed a place in the area to help a sick relative. He wanted people to believe in him in order to make them suffer for trusting him. Item number four, Jamison had a dark side, but he did have some positive characteristics. For example, when he was functioning as a serial squatter, he had a number of pets with him. He genuinely liked his pets, buying them only premium food products and caring for them diligently. He also seemed to like the pets of his roommates. One time he cried when one of his roommate's cats died. Jamison might have got along with pets because he could dominate them. For example, dogs and cats rarely ask for rent money. Number five, Jamison did not treat everybody the same. A friend of his from high school once let him move in. When the friend told him to leave, he did. There was no lawsuit. Jamison used frivolous lawsuits mostly to target people he thought he could intimidate. Which brings me to item number six. The Netflix series made it seem as though Jamison was effective in court, but in reality, he was not. He repeatedly failed to make good arguments in court, and he let his emotions interfere with his performance. Judges saw right through him. One judge indicated that Jamison was frightening. The reason Jamison was so effective at irritating people was simply his persistence. He made people miserable through his continual litigiousness. Item number seven, Jamison was intelligent and graduated from graduate school, but did not seem to have any serious career motivation. He functioned as a tutor for law students, a service he marketed through a website. This made him some money, but he was far from successful. His main career was filing frivolous lawsuits and otherwise arguing with his roommates. Item number eight, Jamison understood the power of paying cash. Many of the people who let him in were desperate for money, and they did not bother looking into his background once he pulled out cash. They had an urgent problem, and he was there with the solution. So they thought. Now moving to my final thoughts. Jamison was very destructive in his life, especially at the end. But his life does teach important lessons. For example, all the factors that make someone appear trustworthy can be faked. And many people who interacted with him incorrectly believed that certain characteristics they perceived were positively associated with trustworthiness, like being well-spoken, tall, attractive, and having pets. Jamison's behavior is a reminder of how important it is to critically evaluate data and to avoid being unduly influenced by attractiveness, fear, or desperation. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jamison Bachman. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.